All right, YouTube, I wanted to make a third occult video uh, because last night I was too, too tired and too bored to do it. Right now, there's a whole bunch of breaking news on Ukraine. There are also stories from China involving the Black Death, the, the bubonic plague, Ebola, and all sorts of weird stuff happening literally as we speak, and the world uh, seems to be spiraling into chaos. Uh, so it's just a good time to cover a new occult topic, something more, you know, happy and... <laughs> and fun to talk about, something uh, involving the occult. Uh, video 3 here uh, is about cryptids, uh, which I was going to cover last night. I, I started making the video and I'm like, nah, it's just not the right time to cover this. Uh, with cryptids, I think uh, some people look at cryptids, uh, anything, Bigfoot, Loch Ness, aliens, anything like that. And they say, well, none of it's real, it's just sort of all in people's heads and so forth. Uh, the, the various skeptics, and, and what people say, what people really mean when they say that they're skeptics is actually that they're deniers. Uh, most people who take up the moniker skeptic uh, simply deny that all of these things are true, assume that they're not true, uh, and even if they are presented with some reasonable level of evidence regarding these creatures, uh, they will continue uh, to deny their existence. <clears throat> uh, and then there are groups of people, and they don't use the term skeptic, that believe in cryptids, they're obsessed with the idea, and they think that all, most or all of them exist. Uh, some of it is fanciful nonsense that they base these views on. Uh, I, I sort of mix and match. I look at cryptids, and I say there are some that we can prove do not exist. There are some where we can pretty much prove they do exist. There are some that we have, in fact, proven exist. Uh, for instance, here's a good example. Uh, when people exploring Australia first brought back reports of kangaroos, uh, these, these bipedal or, or nearly bipedal hopping creatures with pouches full of, uh, full of their young, uh, when they first brought that report back to Europe, people in Europe said, oh, that's crazy talk, you're drunk. Uh, you're smoking too much Chinese opium or something. They said, of course those things don't exist. It turns out it's a very real living creature. It's just something that was out of the ordinary. The idea of the platypus uh, struck people as odd. Um, even like reports of mermaids are based on like manatees and things like that that people wouldn't have been used to. They wouldn't have seen these things before and, and so often. What you have is people simply discount something because they haven't seen it, but they haven't actually gone out and investigated it themselves. Most of the so-called skeptics, which are actually deniers, that have written books about or spoken about or theorized about something like Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster or any of these things, have never even visited any of the locations or talked to any people who have claimed to see them. Uh, you know, you have, and uh, a few years ago, you had sort of a craze on Bigfoot. They had all sorts of Bigfoot mystery specials and stuff like that. Uh, and they conducted uh, uh, lie detector tests and found that people at least thought they had seen Bigfoot. I would say that there are certain types of cryptids that I strongly believe in, some that I think are plausible or possible, but I, don't, I can't really say for sure whether I think they exist or not, and then some that are nonsense. Uh, for instance, in, in the top tier, the ones that I think probably do exist, I would say Bigfoot is on that list. There's too much evidence, there's too much video footage, too much photographic evidence, too much peripheral evidence, the footprints and so forth, uh, droppings and things like that, uh, too many encounters to discount the idea that something like that exists. Now, what is the nature of this creature? No clue. It could be a, a, an endangered hominid. Uh, they've mentioned, I can't remember the exactly on a Gigantopithecus or something like that that they mentioned may have come across the Bering Land Bridge and resulted in this. Uh, and, and these stories go back in native lore around the uh, the northwestern region of the U.S. up into Canada uh, for centuries. Uh, it predates colonial contact. They were already seeing these creatures before Europeans even arrived. In fact, they interacted with them in some of these cultures they claim to have done so. I do believe, however, that most of the authentic encounters are from that region. Essentially, southern Alaska through British Columbia down into, you know, what is uh, Washington State, Oregon, maybe over into Idaho, 
and, and Northern California. This is an extremely wet, lush, biodiverse, extremely uh, biologically rich region. It's not unfa It's also a remote region. Some of these mountains are virtually impassable. It's not a stretch of the imagination to believe that these thousands of square miles of largely uninhabited mountainous uh, pine land uh, are host to creatures that haven't been found. There was a story I saw yesterday about some 12-year-old kid uh, discovered a new genus of spiders. Uh, you've got creatures that aren't found, and I think there are three main reasons why a creature wouldn't be known to science. One, it's very small. Uh, and, and or looks like other small species, something like an insect. Another is it's remote, and another is it's, uh, that it could be shy. It could deliberately avoid contact with humans for whatever reason, perhaps because it's intelligent enough to understand we're potentially violent, uh, perhaps it just spooks them, maybe they're just solitary anyway. Uh, Bigfoot r is rumored to have two of these traits. It's, very, it's not small, but it is supposedly quite shy around humans and inhabits these remote mountain ranges where very few people go. If they go hiking and they see a Bigfoot, usually the Bigfoot runs away or tries to scare them off. I think that there is something there. Uh, I think a lot of the sightings from elsewhere in the country are bears, uh, perhaps an actual human. Perhaps a, some of them are obviously hoaxes. Someone gets in a gorilla suit or something like that. Uh, but say that there's, you know, a six and a half foot tall autistic bum wandering through the woods wearing a leather jacket uh, covered in grass and so forth, you might mistake it for Bigfoot or something. Uh, there have been Bigfoot sightings here in Vermont, there was one not long ago, uh, of supposedly a white Bigfoot. Does that mean that there are Bigfoots uh, hanging around in the north woods of New England? Again, uh, another quite remote area. Possible, yes, I think less likely than the Pacific Northwest. For things like vampires and werewolves, uh, I say these are largely based on medical anomalies uh, and misunderstandings from the Victorian era, lycanthropy and tuberculosis, uh, respectively, as well as more ancient mythology. Uh, that doesn't mean that there isn't some sort of physical basis for the stories. They've simply been transformed severely over time. Modern vampires, the sort of view of them as drinking blood, bats, <laughs> darkness, gravestones, and so forth, living in a coffin, goes back to Count Dracula, uh, Vlad Dracula in, in Romanian, Vlad the Impaler. Uh, and it's questionable as to whether he was actually dipping his bread in blood or whether he was drinking red wine, and that's where uh, these stories of him drinking blood came from. It's not entirely clear which is the case, or maybe both. Uh, it's, it's due to medical conditions. One thing about tuberculosis, it killed people for seemingly no reason in many cases, and, and the corpse would be dug up later. Other people would start getting tuberculosis afterwards. They would suspect the original person who died. They would dig them up, and they would find that magically the, the corpse didn't appear to have... Uh, 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 bloated up and rotted away, and, and it's got blood trickling down its mouth. Well, it must be that this person's a vampire coming back every night to infect other people. The real story is the corpse simply didn't decay. Sometimes it was cold weather and the corpse wasn't decaying at all when they would dig it up. Uh, and the blood trickling down the face is evidence that the bod, the corpse, was leaking. They didn't know this. They didn't really understand the concept of decomposition. Uh, except insofar as a dead animal lying out on the ground and getting feasted upon. The idea of studying the decomposition of a corpse that was put in a box and, and put six feet under the, the ground and potentially refrigerated by the surrounding soil uh, was unknown to them. It would have been considered sacrilege to dig the corpse up and sort of monitor its progress. Of course, now we know that it actually takes a fairly extended period of time for even an unembalmed corpse under those conditions to rot away, as long as it's been protected from maggots and so forth. Um, uh, things like uh, the lake monsters, uh, the Memphremagog monster, Lake Champlain, Loch Ness, I think it's a mixed bag. Uh, I think that it depends on the individual story. I, I think it's more likely that there are lake monsters in places like Lake Champlain, very large bodies of water. That's right here in this state, by the way. I've, I've gone swimming in Lake Champlain. Larger bodies of water, they were once, they are locks. Lake Champlain is technically a lock. It was once part of the ocean connected to the Hudson Bay. 
a larger body of water is more likely to shelter a, uh, a capable of reproduction population of large beings. We have sturgeon in Lake Champlain that are 15 feet long. They're gigantic. Uh, there, are, there are muskies in there that are four or five feet long and have razor sharp teeth. Um, as opposed to Loch Ness, which actually is a fairly small body of water. It's not a, a particularly impressive body of water. It is deep. Uh, there are probably quite large creatures living in it. I think one of the reasons why this took off is that people looked at ancient reports from centuries ago from some of these friars that inhabited the area and started seeing this, this supposed lake monster. What they were probably seeing was simply a large species of fish or something like that. Uh, and then later on, people looked at those myths when they started seeing large fish in there in the modern sense. They looked back and they said, oh, there must be a demon in the water. And so they simply transformed it in their minds into this sort of serpentine shape or this sort of this kelpie uh, creature, sort of a horse-like uh, creature that fits in with some of the native lore. Uh, could there be some sort of, you know, mystical being living there? Yes, uh, of course it is possible. I would think that in that case it's less possible and less likely than a place like Lake Champlain. Uh, to aliens, I think it's unthinkable uh, that they don't exist. I think it's almost certain that there are intelligent alien life forms in other galaxies, probably elsewhere in this galaxy, probably fairly close to this planet. If we look long enough and we do enough studies, we will find that there is life, I believe, in this solar system that is not on this planet. I believe that as they start to study places like Mars and the moon and some of Jupiter's moons and so forth, I believe we will find bacterial life present there, uh, possibly life that is beyond maybe eukaryotes, uh, something that's not even single-celled. I believe it'll be found. They're doing tests on Mars right now. They now know that there are decomposed Earth-like soils on Mars. Until a decade ago or so, we thought Mars was essentially a large, frozen, barren landscape, which used to have water, but probably didn't have life. It was very rocky. Uh, it never really had much of a, a good atmosphere. It was constantly bombarded by cosmic rays and meteors and so forth. We thought that there was no possibility life ever existed there. Now, we've got a new rover on Mars. We find out it's got volcanic soils like Hawaii, indicative that at once that at one time it had volcanic activity and seismic activity as well. We find that it has Earth-like soils. We find evidence that it had flowing water. We find evidence that it had a more advanced atmosphere. Uh, we've found literally every condition possible that could be considered conducive to life on a planet that is right next to ours in this very solar system. If we find so much as one bacterium on Mars, then the odds of life existing elsewhere in the galaxy uh, upon a mathematic principle increase astronomically. Right now they're very low. Finding life right in this solar system would launch us into hyperdrive as far as looking for life elsewhere. I think it would be no, no small task to find it because, of course, these bodies are very remote. With these new telescopes we're using, we found that why at one time, even when I was a kid, we thought that most of the planets out there were very large, they were gas giants, that most planets were not like Earth, that Earth was at least somewhat unique. We now find that simply having more advanced telescopes and being able to see smaller bodies, we now find that something like a third to 40% of all the planets out there are kind of Earth-sized, and that a lot of them are in their habitable zones. We now have seen uh, 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 planets that appear to have Earth-like atmospheres, including cloud formation, running water, oceans, liquid oceans. We've found these things. They are out there. There's uh, No, I believe that it would be very, very strange if this was the only planet with life on it. In fact, if we go another hundred years or so with increasingly advanced technology, if we don't wipe ourselves out or something, and we don't find life somewhere else in this galaxy or in this solar system, I would say that maybe arguments for the existence of a god that considers us cosmically important gain more credence. Because mathematically speaking, we should be somewhere on the middle of a bell curve. This planet is roughly average. 
Uh, we now know that there's a planet right next to ours that at least used to be somewhat more like our own. It probably had more of an atmosphere, had running water and, and decomposing soils, which may be indicative of microbial life at least. Uh, we've, we've found all these things. We've found possible fossilized remains in meteorite chunks. We've found possible fossilized remains on the moon. Uh, what more proof do you need that there is probably at least unadvanced life out there? Micro, I am 100% certain that elsewhere in this very galaxy there are microbes. I'm certain. I don't even say maybe. I say mathematically it approaches the, the value of 100% chance at this point because we've studied these other bodies. I would say yes, there is other life out there. Intelligent life might be a bit of a leap uh, it, and there's one conundrum that they've posed uh, I can't remember the name of it but it's the idea that if we find any sort of alien ruins out there that we should start worrying because it shows that maybe other races routinely kill themselves off or get destroyed uh, that would be rather sad uh, that would sort of blow out the idea that we're cosmically important if that's happening on a regular basis but yes I believe that aliens exist Quite literally. In fact, I think it's fairly likely they've interacted with this planet. I don't think that they're doing it on a constant basis because, again, if our planet is average and they need you know, raw resources or something, they're going to go to some uninhabited planet to get them. They're not going to come here where people will potentially shoot at them or they'll cause chaos. They might have an ethical standard that precludes them from interacting with what they would perceive of as a lesser life form. Uh, they're simply going to go to one of these other planets that don't have anything living on them and mine resources there. If our planet's average, then there should be things like gold and silicon and all these things all over the place. Uh, maybe they, they mine stars for fuel or something. They absorb plasma or energy or something. Uh, they can do that elsewhere. They don't give a shit about us. Uh, they may have engineered us as some sort of slave race like the, uh, the Sumerians thought, uh, but I don't see them walking around here today. Uh, let's see, some other creatures. Uh, then there are creatures that are cryptids, but they're not specifically fantastic beings. Something like uh, if you found a dodo bird. Uh, the, Tasmanian, uh, the Tasmanian tiger is a good uh, example of a creature that's uh, probably extinct, but there are still some sightings of creatures that at least look like them, and they may still exist. The coelacanth is a great example. They thought it was extinct for tens of millions of years and they found living ones off of Australia and they said my god uh, this is this is a creature that hasn't really changed hasn't really evolved for 65 million years it's it's like a dinosaur fish uh, it, it looks insane look, look it up uh, it even looks like a dinosaur almost uh, and they thought it was extinct but they have found it now it is very much alive. It's actually apparently fairly common in some of these deep water areas off Australia. Uh, and they thought that if someone had told them that they saw a coelacanth or, or went fishing and caught a coelacanth, everyone would have thought they were a complete loony. Uh, I think you can probably apply this to a lot of the creatures that we say are extinct. There are remote areas all around this world that are unexplored, largely unexplored, or have been explored but only sporadically and are largely unpopulated. Places like in the middle of the Amazon, in the middle of the Congo, uh, the Gobi Desert, some of the areas in Siberia, even northern Canada, uh, parts of the Rockies, right here in the United States, some of these desert areas and high mountains in the middle of the country, they're explored, we can see them by satellite, there are scattered populations living around them, but they're few and far between. There could be all sorts of species we do not know about. I would say subterranean species and aquatic species are key on this. For all of the new species that we find in jungles and deserts and so forth, there are probably more species living below our feet and, and potentially living in some of these very remote areas, yes, on land, but also below our feet and also out at sea because those are even less explored. Subterranean areas are, are less explored than the oceans. They say that the oceans are man's final frontier here on Earth. I would say that the caves right below you are less explored than that. And, and we've found evidence of bacteria miles down in the crust. Uh, there are potentially life forms. We found, you know, uh, people used to talk about, oh, well, I found a, this white blind fish in this cave. 
people would have thought they were a lunatic too. They'll ghost fish. What the hell are you talking about? How much wine have you had to drink today? We now know it's a, that they exist and they're fairly common caves all over the world. Cave spiders, you know, that are you know big as a dish plate. Uh, these these cave spider various bat species and so forth there could be hominids living down there we wouldn't even know hominids that just eat you know raw bat blood and and feast on subterranean mushroom farms or something it could happen uh, I'm not going to get into the inner earth I think that's best for another video but really with cryptid research you sort of have to pick and choose and and there are cases where you can't be sure. Uh, they can't be sure if there are Tasmanian tigers that still survive. The area is remote. Uh, if there are any, the population is probably very small. Or it could be that some of these early sightings were true and there was one tiger, one Tasmanian tiger left and now it's dead and they'll never find one again. Uh, that's another, by the way, species that they're hoping to revive. In that case, I would say it's more morally correct than an, than an ancient species. Man's the, uh, responsible largely for wiping some of these creatures out. If we can bring them back uh, through through cloning uh, their tissue that we have on, on hand, then yeah, we should probably do that because we're the ones that got rid of them. Even though we're technically a force of and part of nature, uh, I think ethically speaking, it's fine to reintroduce a species that you've uh, killed off accidentally. Right now, it's funny, we're actually trying to depopulate mosquitoes by using literally genetically modified mosquitoes. Uh, and I was going to get into ghosts, but I think again, I'll, I'll save that for Occult Video 5 or whatever. Uh, because they're not really a cryptid. Some people say they're an intelligent being. Are they? Not sure. Thunderbirds uh, is one that I'm particularly interested in. Some of these very large birds. Uh, I can't remember the name. There's a type of woodpecker. Uh, supposedly extinct uh, or, or extremely extremely endangered and they think that they've found them again they think that they, there are a few that have survived down in the south I can't silver something wood it's this giant ass woodpecker it's like three feet long and they thought that they were all gone uh, around here we have just peleated woodpeckers uh, but these ones are gigantic and have a, a unique call and they've actually heard this call in some of these swampy areas they think that they're not quite dead but if you were to see one, you would, you would have to state that it's a cryptid. Because officially, it's extinct. Or at least, I think it's, it's officially extinct or ex officially extinct in this region. I can't remember. I think it's officially extinct. It's like if you saw a great ack. Uh, or, or again, a dodo bird. Uh, so they would be a cryptid. Uh, any of these creatures, you know, some of these uh, sharks that we only rarely see. Uh, these, these ones, the goblin-faced shark or whatever it's called. Uh, with the big, really weird face that looks like its mouth can literally like come out like a tentacle, uh, is kind of a cryptid. Uh, because we don't really know anything about them. We don't know about their feeding habits very much. We don't know necessarily where they migrate to. Uh, all we've ever seen are dead specimens, or specimens that are sick and, and floundering in the surf. Uh, so giant squids are a great example. Until a while ago, people thought that the idea of a giant squid was nonsense. They said, well, drunken sailors drew these pictures of giant squids. We now know there really are 100-foot-long squids. If you go out fishing in the ocean, deep-sea fishing, there are squid below you that are probably bigger than your boat. Uh, how does that make you feel? Uh, but yeah, with cryptids, I think it, it depends on the creature. Some of them I'm certain exist. Some of them I'm pretty certain exist. Some of them are probably hoaxes. I think the Loch Ness Monster, unfortunately, for, even though it's a really uh, everyone's favorite cryptid, I hate to say it, but the most famous photograph of the Loch Ness Monster is proven to be a hoax, number one. And the stories that go back centuries don't make it clear that they're not just talking about an exceptionally large trout or something like that. I don't even know if trout live in the loch, so don't, don't quote me on that, but we're not exactly sure what they were referring to. It could have been literally they were just seeing big fish. Uh, so I wish that such a creature would exist. I think it's possible, but unfortunately I don't think it's likely. I think it's more likely that the Lake Champlain monster exists or, or the, uh, the monster in Lake Memphis, Memphis Magog, uh, the Manitou, uh, all these native legends and so forth. I'm very interested in cryptids. Uh, I want them all to exist. I want all, I, everything under the sun that has to do with the paranormal. I want it to be real. But I have to apply my logic and say some of it is hoax 
and some of it is misunderstanding a very real creature and giving it attributes that aren't real, and some of it's just complete nonsense. Uh, and then you can delve into Eastern spirituality, kind of what I said about wavelengths, and you can kind of look at the Buddhist explanations and say, well, maybe there really are Nagas uh, going around and Mongolian death worms, tatzel worms, and all these things. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but keep an open mind because some of these things probably are real. Uh, I believe that Bigfoot and aliens and things like that are, are probably true. Um, that's just my take. Occult video number three, loosely based uh, with the occult. It's more paranormal video number three, but it fits in with the occult with things like basilisks, as I said uh, in my previous video. That's about all. Peace out.